Hey, how's it going, guys? Anybody fired up here? <laughs> I'm all out of breath because I had to go all the way to the back and all the way to the back row in the balcony just to take a moment and praise God for his faithfulness in gathering together so many hungry hearts to hear from the Lord. Amen. Now we did this a conference in Toronto and we did it also in Los Angeles. And I'm just catching my breath. Stall, stall. Mental note, work out. <laughs> or not. But we did this conference in two other places, and I'm especially glad to do it here. And I hope you'll indulge me in saying uh, welcome uh, to the men uh, of the Harvest Bible Chapel in Chicago that I'm privileged to be the pastor of. Welcome to our own men. We are really glad that all of you are here and we are trusting God for some great things. And uh, when I go to a conference like this, um, at the outset, I'm not going to preach now, I get to preach tomorrow, but I'm just going to kind of warm up a little bit because uh, I know when you go to something like this, uh, how many of you, let me just say first of all, how many of y'all kind of sort of didn't actually come here, you more got dragged here? Uh, hands, hands up, dragged here. Totally, put your hand right up, man, I got dragged here, I can't believe it, I got dragged here. So then you're sitting here and you got dragged here and you're like, what's coming? What's going to happen? How long is this going to be? So, uh, what guys just like to know at the beginning, and I'm like that anyway, I, I'm about as subtle as a hand grenade, so we always say sometimes people leave our church upset, but nobody leaves saying, what was he trying to say? So, uh, we, want, we just want to be like uh, as clear as we co possibly can about what Act Like Men is. So if I could just have your attention for a few minute, uh, minutes, brothers, let me just say, first of all, uh, Act Like Men uh, began uh, as a burden. Uh, it was a burden uh, that was on my heart before I talked to anybody else about it. Um, uh, it was a burden because men, uh, let me just say this, uh, men matter. We live in a world that is uh, constantly uh, erasing and, and eroding the ground that God has given uh, to men to stand on. It's, it's our ground, it's given to us by God, and, and uh, like everything that God has done in this world, after he made it, he pronounced it good, and uh, men are a good idea. And in fact, as I study the scriptures, I see that whenever God wants to get something done, a fact is, he gets a man. If God wants something changed, if God wants something fixed, if God wants something grown, if God wants something turned around, if God wants something revived, he gets a man. Turn to your neighbor and say, he gets a man. Amen. Same thing I do when I want something done. I get him, I call my friend, we get some men together, we get something done. Now we're going to get something done here. The Bible says uh, that God said, I sought for a man. There was a gap, there was a space. There was something that wasn't happening that needed to happen, and God says, I sought for a man. And so act like men is a statement that men matter. Uh, secondly, and I don't have to uh, give you a ton of detail on this, uh, men are in trouble. Uh, men are in serious trouble. Uh, shallowness, uh, uh, silliness, honestly, surface entertainment, sensuality, these things are encroaching upon the place that God has reserved for himself in the lives of men. Uh, we're losing our, our sons. The vast majority of young men that grow up in church are not following Jesus in the next generation. And, and that's got to change. And, and somebody's got to stand up and say, we're not doing good enough. We're not giving God our best. We're, we're, we're letting important priorities slip off the table as we give ourselves to things that don't matter and won't last. And so this has been a great burden. Now let me say as we uh, get underway, only Jesus Christ can solve the problems that men are facing in our country. Anything you have to conquer, 
anything you have to win over, anything you have to get to a better place on, Jesus Christ is been there, done that, all right? He is our Savior, He is our Lord, He is our example, and if that's all new to you, you need to lean into that, step into that this weekend, and Jesus Christ will meet you right where you are and change your life dramatically forever. Now, uh, Act Like Men then was first a burden. Uh, then it was a Bible verse. One of the reasons I'm glad to have uh, over a thousand of uh, the men from our church in Chicago have come down to this event. And one of the reasons why I'm so happy to have them here is because we had our own men's conference in our church uh, maybe a couple of years ago now. And I was trying to figure out what to speak on. And I found this verse, 1 Corinthians 16, uh, 13, and 14. If you have a Bible, you could open and look at it. We're going to actually ask you to commit this verse to memory over the next 24 hours. So if, uh, let's see if the Bible's in, y'all bring a Bible, hold your Bible up in the air, we'll even take fake Bibles now, hold them all up, that's fine. <laughs> Go ahead, hold them up high, don't take them down, I want this total effect. That's fantastic. Now get that Bible back in your lap and get it open to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Let me read two verses to you. The Apostle Paul says this, Be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong, let all that you do be done in love. And I have to say that I've, I've just been really gripped by that verse. And, and people are like, act like men. What's that mean? It's in the Bible. You should read the whole New Testament. It's amazing. And, and this, this verse, it's not my idea, act like men. It's God's idea. God wants men to act like men. I'll say more about that in a moment. First it was a burden. Then it was a Bible verse. Then it was a conversation. Uh, Matt Chandler, who's here sitting in the front row, Mark Driscoll, whose uh, plane is just landing and he's on his way over here. Um, we were just talking about this very issue that men seem to be struggling. Men seem to be fighting to get victory over, you know, some basic things that should not be that hard for a follower of Jesus. And, and something has to change and something in our nation needs to change. And I think all of you probably have a sense that things are not going well. If you've got a three or a four uh, at the front of your birthday or a five or a six or a seven, then you've been watching this for a while and you have enough dots out in front of you to say, this is not going in a good direction. How many people would agree with that, that our country's not going in a good direction? All right. And I, I honestly, I couldn't care less if you're Democrat or Republican or pro or against this or that president. I'm just telling you the totality of it. Everybody thinks the next guy's going to do better than the last guy, and we don't ever seem better off. We certainly don't seem to have a bigger place for God, who's the only one who can impact and change our society and how desperately we need that. So something's going to have to change. And, and what the Bible says is that judgment has to begin at the house of God. It, 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 it has to begin with us. It has to begin with God's people. It has to begin with God's men. And so as Matt and I uh, and Mark and I talked about this, we're like, man, we can, can we do something? And, and I've had people say to me, you know, you know, your big conference, that's not, that's not, that's not going to, that's not everything. I'm like, well, what are you doing? What's your thing? Well, well I don't think your thing's going to, well, what's your thing? Look, 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 newsflash, criticizing somebody else's thing isn't a thing, okay? Well, I don't really have a thing, but I don't think your thing's a thing. That's not a thing, okay? We're, we're trying to do something, amen? And maybe what if, what if God, what if God would step into these weak men and, 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 and our desperate need and just our showing up and coming here and sitting and saying, God, something has to be different. Something has to change. And, and what if God would come and show up here in power? And what if God would take us to the mat with the full weight of who he is? And what if we would forget about this preacher or that song and God showed up and laid us all out? How many people believe we could go home tomorrow afternoon different than what we are right now? And so after it was a burden and then a verse and then a conversation, then it really became a vision. The vision that God's given me for my life and that we share in our church 
is revival in the church in North America in our lifetime. That's what I'm working on. That's what God's working on me about. When I lay awake and ask God why he's doing what he's doing, why he's allowing what he's allowing, why he's has us under his mighty hand so heavily and so painfully at times, I just pray and cry out that it's for the purpose that I believe that God has laid upon my heart, which is revival in the church in North America in our lifetime. We, we have to have to see that. Do you understand that years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, we, there would be revival speakers that would come to churches. The regular pastor would take a break, and the revival preacher, we don't even have revival preachers anymore, it seems, and the revival preacher would get up, and, and he would just be like, repent! Let's pray. And, and, and the, the, the regular preacher, he's preaching process, you know, and how to walk with God and how to love your family and how to do all the things that he's preaching the process all the time. But then the revival preacher would come and he, we'd have a crisis and men need a crisis. And we're praying that this is going to be a crisis for you. I don't think this is going to be ultimate life change. You're going to have to go back to your church. You're going to have to get deeper into your fellowship with your brothers. You're going to have to get serious and honest and accountable. You're going to have to do all those things. But before a man can ever, ever succeed in the process, he has to have a regular crisis. Where, where the, the, the guest preacher, the revival preacher shows up and goes, What are you doing over there? Get back over here. This is where God wants you. And then most men are like, I don't even know what I was doing over here. I didn't, it just kind of happened to me. Just turn to your neighbor and say, it kind of happened. It just kind of happened. And am I telling the truth? And just one little decision and one kind of bad choice and then something else. And all of a sudden, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. And it's time, as Hosea said, come, let us return to the Lord. Man, let us turn and return and come back to the God of our salvation and give him first place in our lives and give him first place in our homes. That's what this is about. Now, this, is, <laughs> this has been a problem at every conference. There doesn't seem to be consensus on when we should clap. And so I'm going to make this center section here. Y'all are in charge of clapping. If the center section starts clapping, it's time. If they don't, it's okay. It's time to clap. All right? Now follow your lead from now on. Stop interrupting the preacher. If they're clapping, it's good. Otherwise, not so much. Now, I want to give you a four statements uh, to make it very clear how this is going to all roll out so you know what's happening. In a few moments, uh, Greg Laurie is going to come. We're going to sing, and then Greg Laurie is going to come. And he's going to preach on watch. See, I think act like men is the hub in this passage. And then the statements are the spokes around it. So Greg's going to speak on watch. In the morning, Matt Chandler is going to speak on stand firm in the faith. Both of those are incredible messages. Then Pastor Mark Driscoll is going to speak on be strong. And he can, and he is. Then after lunch, Lecrae, and I'm going to speak on uh, let all that you do be done in love. And then there's a man I'm going to introduce to you in a moment named Eric Mason, and he's going to be our conference host. He's going to have some things to say to us after every session, and he's going to have some things to say to us at the end of it. And in all of that, if you could turn down your emphasis on which person you're hearing from and turn up your emphasis on its two verses in one passage, all of it together is God's message for me. And I'd like to start off with just a little definition of what it means to act like men. And because I like things simple, I'm going to give it to you simple. Here it is, all right? Act like a man. Act like men, first of all, uh, means uh, don't act like a woman. Okay? Uh, put up your hand if you think you understand that. All right, now let me just say, let me just say at the outset here that... Um, I'm a big fan of the uh, female. I think that's like one of the best things that God did. I'm happily married for 30 years. I got an awesome wife. How many people are generally a fan of women? Okay, I think this is a clap time. 
And uh, I, I don't want to say anything disparaging. I don't want to say anything dismissive of, of women. If I had my choice, if I had to go right now and say, I'm going to be here for a long time, but all the men are going or all the women are going, that would be a really easy choice for me. And, and, and I, I, I don't want to say anything disparaging about women. Amen? Amen? Women is an awesome idea, but God doesn't want men to be women. You, you say, what do you mean? What I, what I mean is this. Men are made to lead. All right? What I mean when I say don't act like a woman, I mean lead. Lead. If something cruddy comes on the television at your house, your wife's not supposed to be the person to say, I don't think we should be watching this. All right? If, 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 you're, if a portion of your income is not going back to the Lord's work, it shouldn't be your wife who's always pestering you to be faithful to God. If there's no praying going on around your table before they eat, your wife shouldn't have to be egging you on all the time to make sure you're... That's your job. That's your job. You're the man. You're supposed to be leading. All right? And, and there's a good reason why you're supposed to be leading. The woman is made to help. She's a helper. That's what it says in the book of Genesis. You're the leader, she's the helper. 1 Peter 3 says that you're to give honor to your wife as to the weaker vessel. She's the weaker vessel. She's the weaker vessel. You're the stronger vessel. Things hurt her that aren't supposed to hurt you. Things weigh on her that aren't supposed to weigh on you. She's not supposed to be worrying. You're supposed to be carrying the weight of those things. You're the man. Don't act like a woman. You say, well, actually, you'd have to meet my wife. She's pretty strong. She, <laughs> she flat out could beat me in an arm wrestle. You need to hear this. That says more about you than it does about her. Okay? Your wife's not supposed to be stronger than you. Get in the gym. <laughs> All right? You're supposed to be the strong one. Physically, emotionally, spiritually. If act like a man means that man means anything, it means don't act like a woman, and then this. It also means don't act like an animal. I'm not trying to pump up some false, macho misunderstanding about what it means to be a man. And when I'm like, don't act like a woman, you're like, yeah, yeah, right on, yeah. Yeah, yeah. hang on, hang on. Don't act like a woman. You're like, I love that part. Maybe you won't love this part as much. Don't act like an animal. Men aren't supposed to be animals. You say, well, what do you mean? Well, you have a dog. How many people have dogs? How many people have cats? You would not put your hand up. I know you wouldn't. Do not put your hand up. <laughs> Dude, no one wants to know if you have a cat. Trust me on that. <laughs> we were just talking about being strong, weren't we? All right, I'm kidding. Come on. So you have a dog. We, have a, we had a little dog uh, for a long time, and it was my daughter, so it wasn't a super masculine dog. I won't give the make and model of the dog. It was, it was, it was kind of weak. But anyway, one time we were having these really well-famous, I would say, people over to our house. I won't say who they were. We'll just say that we were just blown away that they were coming to our house. And, and so we had everything put together. We cleaned the house. We put everything in order. I mean, we were on it, on it, on it. And, and sure enough, they come to the front door, and we're a little nervous, you know, and, and I can't believe they're here, and they parked, in the, and they're coming right up to the door. I can't believe this, that they're coming to our house. And, and in the front door, they come, and sure enough, while we're shaking their hand, there's our dog sitting back on his hind legs, licking his private. <laughs> really? Now? <laughs> then, then we're having dessert. And we're sitting in our living room and everything was so cleaned and just put together in these little teacups and the whole lunch was, everything was going perfect. And here comes our dog dragging his rear across the carpet with his paws like this. Really? Turn to your neighbor and say, he's an animal. Yeah, here's the, th animals don't care about anything but themselves. Animals, you say, well, my dog, he loves me. He loves what you do for him. Get a clue. Okay? Animals only think of themselves. 
And I wonder how many men are at this conference and living in the same house with you, sleeping in the same bedroom with you. You're like an animal. You treat your bedroom like a locker room. The noises you make and the places you put your hands and the things you do, there's a woman beside you. You're like an animal. Man is an awesome, God-honoring concept. God doesn't need his men to be women. God doesn't need his men to be animals. And then this, act like a man means don't act like a child. Don't act like a child. Paul said, when I was young, I thought like a child, I spoke like a child, I reasoned like a child, but when I became a, what? When I became a man, I put away childish things. When I became a man, and, and some of you are still acting like children. Now, you're young only once, but you can be immature for life. And some of you who are in your 50s are still like you're in your teens. And, and well, what do you mean a child? Here's a child. I have five grandsons right now, all uh, preschool. I want, 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 where, 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 where? Is that annoying? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, wait till you get all five of them together. It's loud. And I love my grandkids, and I really like it when they go home. <laughs> but I have to say this. How many high school students, how many children, how many wives are living with men that are boys? They're just boys. And every day they think about what they want and how they're going to get it and where they're going to get it from and how they can cut the corner and how they can keep the secret and how they can beat the odds and how they can take care of... I want, I want, I want! That's got to die. That, how awesome it would be if some boys got laid out here, came in as boys and left as men. And so again, this isn't really so much of a sermon as it is an overview of what's coming so you can begin to prepare your heart for it. The last thing is, is that act like a man means don't act like a woman, don't act like an animal, don't act like a boy, and this. Don't act like a superhero. I just want to just say uh, there just are too many men who can't be honest, who can't be open who can't disclose where they're really at. Now, the men in my own church know that I did my doctoral thesis on increasing the incidence of self-disclosure of sin among men. And I have had to walk further and more deeply into men's sin, I would guess, than almost anybody here. And, and, and I have a very, very, very good handle on what men battle, what men struggle with, where they face it, how it affects them. And part of my study was on James 5.16, which says, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. And the way that men continue in sin and defeat is through secrecy. And what men desperately need is a place where they can be open and honest with one another. And I would like to declare this arena and all of its hallways as a place where men can get with other men and be open and honest. Now, here's what I know. Men will open up to other men about where they're really struggling if two things are true. Number one, uh, there has to be confidentiality. An amazing thing that you could say to a brother that you're here with is, is, brother, I want you to know this. You can tell me anything, and I would die before I would tell anyone else. I will not tell my wife. I will not tell our pastor. I will not tell a soul. I will carry what you tell me to the grave. Men need that. They, they don't open up because they fear where that's going. And so we keep it a secret and we manage our sin ourselves and it eats away at the inside of us. 
So men need assurance of confidentiality. Second thing they need is mutuality. Now there's not a man in this room that couldn't get to a place of honest confession about some kind of sin or struggle in his life. And there's nothing worse than when your brother says, well, I mean, if you promise you're not going to say anything, then here's where I've been really, just really struggling. And then you tell the guy, and he's like, dude, that's rough, man. I'll pray for you. Really? You're not going to come back with anything yourself? You're going to leave me hanging here like that? Turn to your neighbor and say, I won't do that. All right? I'm serious as a heart attack right now. Listen, I won't do that. I won't do that. I won't leave you like that. I won't take a superior position over my brother and let him unburden his heart to me and then act like there's nothing going on, no struggle of any kind in my life. I won't do that. I won't dishonor God like that. And I won't dishonor his honesty like that. If a man can be assured of confidentiality and if a man can be assured of mutuality, we can get to some awesome places with one another here over the next day. Now here's the final thing. When James 5.16 says, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed, you're like, well, why would I confess my sin to my brother? I mean, only God can forgive sin. Anybody knows that. And that's true. We don't confess our sins to our brother for forgiveness. We confess our sins to our brother for assurance of forgiveness. Is it not true that Satan grinds even God's sons under his heel with, what do you mean you're sorry? You'll do that again. You've said this before. You're going to fall again. This is nothing new. This isn't going any, see? And he'll put these lies into our heads. And that's where now I've actually talked to my brother about this. We've got a plan. And I'm going to be different. And I'm going to change. And here's the, here's the things I'm working on. And if I fall, here's the plan. And we're going to get up together. And we're going to go forward together. And, and, and we're going to walk with Jesus together and see when we um, have confessed our sins to our brother he assures us and says no no bro I was there you dealt with that God's forgiven you that's not in that's in your past that's not in your future God's changing you I know it you're a different man than you were and that openness with our brother is what sets the stage for that kind of mutuality and assurance of forgiveness so act like a man Acts, or pardon me, 1 Corinthians 16, 13, and 14. Now watch, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong, let all that you do be done in love.